Hi everybody and welcome back to my War Games hobby channel, Alec here. Uh, you can see I'm in my lounge, it's a bit cold out to in my little bolt hole today and I'm not going to put the heating on for like an hour to warm it up so I'm just going to talk in my lounge because I just want to chat to you about something. And what that is, is uh, you know I'm quite keen on uh, line ramping. In fact, if anything, they are my favourite rules at the moment. I play them quite a bit. They're ideal for an evening game down the, down the War Games Club. And um, there's about, sort of, we've got six or eight people that play them quite regularly. And we really have good time with them. But a couple of things have happened recently, which have been discussed on various forums and amongst ourselves. And uh, points have been made about uh, videos we've done about how we play the rules. So um, I just wanted to talk that through with you now to see what you think. What I'm talking about is um, activations. Now, as the rules go, if you look at the book, it, um, it says here quite clearly that a failed ordered activation test will end your activation phase immediately although later on it does go to say um, at each turn you may re-roll one fouled move attack or shoot test but no other tests uh, within 12 inches of your leader's model unless he or she is battered uh, you may choose to use this re-roll on your leader's own unit if you wish and then on the following page, there's an alternative rule for failed activations. Because um, what we're saying is that the way the, the rules have been written is that you've got 24 point army. And if you, let's say it's five or six units. And if you fail on one of those units, then your turn's over. Um, but there is an alternative one where you can roll every single unit once. And obviously, once a unit fails, you just move on to the next unit. And it's really finding a, a sort of something that works for you. We have found at the club that that last method I mentioned, where everybody gets to roll, isn't that popular. Because it means that um, the units that are harder to activate, will, will you'll give them a chance to activate every single move. Um, like crossbows, for example, if they want to shoot. Um, they're supposed to be harder to activate and they activate on 7 plus and knights move on 7 plus so they're hard to activate so every move they will have one opportunity to to do that and if they fail you move on to the next unit well that is fine but it, it means they will at least get a, a chance to activate every single move if you use the method where um, a unit when a unit fails that turn is over you have to carefully think about which unit you're going to move next so what you would do is you'd use you'd move the units that are easier to move you know that that move on five plus for example most units move on five plus so you'd move all those first in the hope that you will move most of your army and leave the hard ones to last so it takes a bit of thinking about you you don't risk for example in your very first move unit moving a unit of knights if there's a pretty good chance that might fail and then the rest of your army does nothing. So that's not sort of popular really at our club. So we decided to use the, the role where you can uh, re-roll the, the first or a missed roll. Okay. But then we came with the problem, well, what happens then if you, if you pass, if you then do a second roll for that unit and you pass, do you carry on uh, activating the rest of the units in your warband until you get a second failure? Uh, it doesn't actually say that in the rules, but I know a lot of people do that. They Because, you know, you re-roll the activation, it has worked this time, and then you continue. Once you get that second failure, that's your game over. And that seems to be generally what a lot of people do. Not all, it's fair to say. And it doesn't actually say that in the rules. That's also fair to say. But the assumption is that if you fail, you, that's it, your, your move's over anyway. That If you fail the re-roll, that is. But if you, if you manage to activate, then you should continue with, that, um, with your units until you get a second fail. To make things even more complicated, 
is the rule where if that unit was more than 12 inches away from the leader and therefore it doesn't qualify to have a re-roll, is your turn then over? The trouble with that is that um, it would mean that a lot of units aren't within 12 inches of the leader, especially if you're playing a scenario where half your army is the other end of the board, other end of the table, then it makes it really difficult. And we don't like to stifle a game. We, we've, we felt at our club, and we had long chats about this, that we would assume, that's always a dangerous thing to do, of course, assume that if you pass your re-roll, then you continue rolling until you get that second failure and then that is your move is over. It's a happy medium really between um, stopping entirely after your first failure, which no one likes because it means if you're unlucky and you're, if, you're, if you're me, often you can sit and do two or three moves without moving anything at all because you know I roll particularly bad dice quite regularly and um, I have had games where I've been sat on the, on the baseline and not moved for two or three moves. So, and I, I don't have a big problem with that myself, but I know a lot of people didn't like that idea. So we decided to adopt the, the re-roll situation. But because of units that are often quite a long way away from the leader, fail, that does end your turn again. It was stifling the game too much. So what we agreed to do was that if the unit was within 12 inches, it would re-roll. If it passed, the turns would continue. You, you activate the next unit. If it failed, for the second time you've re-rolled, then that is the move over. If a unit is more than 12 inches away, you lose that uh, option to re-roll, but it doesn't end your move. We let other units now um, attempt to activate, and on the second failure, it stops. It's not in the book. Um, it's really just uh, um, a continuation of, if you like, the idea that a unit that does activate after a failed activation and the re-roll does activate that it continues and we feel you're just losing that opportunity to re-roll that unit if it is more than 12 inches away is enough penalty without then ending your turn as well it'll be interesting to see what others think about this because it, it is quite a, a hot potato really so and as he's always said in his books if if you feel something doesn't work for you um, then change it you know and that's what we've done and that's what we have done now for the last couple of years and it seems to work quite well so let me just summarize you can move you start activating your units if you get a failure and it's within 12 inches you re-roll that unit if it fails then that is game over because you fell twice if it succeeds that unit moves and then you continue activating until you get a second failure. If in the instance where the first failure, the unit is more than 12 inches away, you don't re-roll that because it's more than 12 inches from the leader, but you still continue to activate other units until you get that second failure. That's how we do it, rightly or wrongly. We're happy with that. It seems to work. It doesn't stifle the game. We don't want to go the other way where everybody every unit gets a chance to roll because that is then too um, advantageous if you like to units that are difficult to move like knights and crossbows they do get the opportunity every move uh, to activate and we feel that's too much so we've sort of gone a happy medium if you like we've gone an in-between and it, it works for us so that's where <laughs> it's a bit of a complicated subject I hope I, I hope I've explained it um, clearly enough but that's what we're doing. So if you watch any of our videos, you'll see us failing twice before um, we move on to the next person or the, the moves go across to your opponent. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. <laughs> Let me know what you think down below. Put some comments. The second thing I wanted to talk about was um, myself and Graham, we've been building up 100-year wars armies. Um, Graham's done French and English and I've done French and I'm just in the middle of painting an English army but Graham became very keen to explore other um, units or other nationalities and one of the ones he decided to do would be Scots and um, he's painted them up 
and he's got a lot of a lot of spearmen or you could call them pikemen because that's what they had and um we've been playing them and they're just getting slaughtered <laughs> that we just can't win with them they just are not happening interestingly enough if you look in the book there's a section and we've tried we've tried all different things to try and make the rules um work for a primarily sort of pike army let me read out what it says about about converting what would normally be a spear unit of heavy infantry to pikemen instead heavy infantry and light infantry can be upgraded to pikes so it's one point per unit so defense value becomes three plus plus versus mounted units um, cannot be used with veteran upgrade so that's interesting but may still form wall of spears the problem with that is that if you're fighting an english army which is really what scots mostly used to do um they're going to come a cropper against bow fire because wall of spears uh, you don't get any extra defense for being a wall of spears from shooting you only get it against um, attacks and if you're an English player, you're not going to want to charge Pike anyway. Um, so you're going to keep the cavalry back and you're just going to be shooting them to bits with lots of longbow, which is what happens in every game. The, 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 the heavy infantry, if you upgrade them the Pike, get really badly beaten. They get decimated by longbow fire before they get anywhere near fighting them. The other thing you can do is, um, it says here some players have also asked about mobile um, Pike formations which actually might be the answer so a mobile shieldron so a plus one or plus two points per unit allows units to move in wall of spears formation at half speed the trouble is if you go into wall of spears and even if you do half speed which is what it's saying that you can do for another point it's going to take you too long to reach the the long long bows by the time you get there you're decimated of course, you could make them go at full speed, and that would be interesting, but that's two points a unit. So if you have pikes and you have them go at full speed, that's an extra three points, that's seven points a unit. You don't get many units for a 24-point game. And even then, they then only attacking on um, the normal heavy infantry factors, they're hitting on five plus they only get the, the better factors if they're defending and uh, the english are just not going to attack them they're just going to shoot them to bits or right, they might send their knights in eventually but the damage has been done by the long goes long before that so the pike part of the book doesn't really work for scots um, they're just too expensive and they're if you make them fast if you don't make them fast, they're not going to get there in time. And that's still six points a unit anyway. So it just doesn't work. I don't think the pike um, option in the book works well for, for Scots. The other thing we then decided to do was, well, we're just, uh, they, they were, they, whether they were full full pikes or not, but they were, they were longer than spears maybe. We're just as cool heavy infantry as they are and upgrade them to veteran so that they actually if they do get stuck in they do attack they hit on fours and they've got a better chance of surviving but they're still going to take heavy casualties going in um and and every time we played that they're just not surviving because again it's six points a unit although they are against uh, long bows which are also six points so but even so the, the long bows do seem to um, decimate the the heavy infantry before they get there of course, you can make them light infantry spears, uh, which are cheaper. They're only three points. But if you want them to be aggressive, you, and again, it's two points to put them on the five points to make them veteran. So maybe you don't do that. So maybe we should just try Scots as um, unarmored you know, spearmen or heavy infantry, but with no upgrades at all. At least you can get more units. For example, heavy unit, if you upgrade two units to veteran that's 12 points or would you rather have three units that are not graded for 12 points no, i think that would probably be better but they're not going to be quite as good at charging in and they do need to win the, the scots do need to to charge in of course you could have other units with them 
you could have, for example, a unit of mounted knights. There's no reason why not. The Scots did have knights. They didn't have many of them, it's fair to say. But they, um, they certainly could be used. Uh, but you'd probably only have one of them. And is that going to be enough to win the game? So we're having a real problem um, with, with Scottish uh, forces. Because um, they just get, uh, they keep getting hammered, frankly. If you look, in fact, at the, uh, the list in the book, what it suggests for Scottish, um, that sort of, uh, well, it, it's, it's after the Wars of Roses, it says here, but that, I think, would cover Hundred Years' War as well. So you've got elite infantry, so you could use elite infantry, that's a possibility, which we have done. Four units of heavy infantry and a unit of skirmishers. But, as I say, against the English, that just doesn't seem to be working. I know Graham had a game the other day with an elite unit of infantry, but it made no difference. They still got shot to bits before they, they came into contact. And if, if someone knows they're fighting Scots, they might not even have knights, for example. They might just have lots of uh, infantry, the bowmen, and, um, although they, that would be a bit cheesy, I suppose. But they could have some heavy infantry to, to counteract that stay defensive, make the Scots come forward. They're going to have better factors when they fight if they're charged, but they use their bows to, to shoot them up. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to know what you guys felt about that. The Scots do seem to be um, very vulnerable. Mind you, in history, that's exactly what they were. Um, you know, Edward I certainly, certainly uh, took advantage of the fact that... Um, that the Bofar could destroy uh, Scottish uh, pikemen. And um, that was the problem that the Scottish pikes had. They, they did have some victories, it's fair to say, but mostly it, soon they, Edward I and other kings soon realised that to beat the Scots, all they've got to do is, is stand back and, and shoot them down with, with bows. Don't send knights in because the Scots would love that. There, there were a few battles where that happened, of course, um, and uh, we, the English paid the price, but as a war game, it just doesn't seem to be working. So, guys, the question is, what do you do? What would you do? Would you make them all light infantry, uh, heavy infantry with no upgrades? Would you have a unit of knights or a unit of dismounted knights? Or elite infantry, that is. What would you do? We're certainly struggling to find um, a way to win with Scots against English their traditional uh, enemies and um, yeah we just don't know what the answer is so see what you have a look at it and let me know down below again what you think about that so that's it guys a nice discussion point two subjects on these rules that are like lion rampant i'll be interested to hear your thoughts right see you again soon